Today's reading is from Matthew chapter 18, verses 5 to 9. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the internal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with the two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. This is the word of the Lord. So our Lord has been using this small child to teach us about what real greatness is in God's kingdom. Also, how you can enter into the kingdom of God. You must have childlike faith, a faith that has no concern for things like greatness and power, a faith that intrinsically loves and trusts that God will provide everything you need for life and godliness and, and eternal life. At the same time, we know there's nothing we can do to offer to him to, to attain or purchase or buy salvation. Salvation is a free gift of God. It is by his mercy, it is by his grace, who in love sent Jesus Christ to live the life for us and die for us in our place. Because of what Christ has done, we must be humble. We must be humble like a child as we love and we serve others for the sake of Christ. But we must not be childish in our faith, naive and ignorant of the teachings of the scriptures. It is this humble faith of a child that we are building upon this morning. We're going to see how Jesus commands us to live with humility and the way we treat one another, uh, other believers, and the way we also aggressively do battle with sin in our own lives. That's really the goal of Christ's teaching here in Matthew chapter 18, to teach us how to treat others in the church. What kind of attitudes must we have must characterize us as believers? As we know, even though we are forgiven by grace, we are have the Holy Spirit within us, we still do sin. We will offend one another. If you grew up in the church, you're going to be spending the next 80 years, right, living with one another in a spiritual family or so. How do we reconcile? How can we be at peace with each other? How can we reflect this new covenant Christian community that we must have and be so the gospel is, the power of the gospel is on display? So this morning we're looking at how we can protect other believers from sin and how to protect ourselves from sin. That's our outline for us right there. And our goal is that the Holy Spirit will use his word to convict us, where we need to change, how we need to have greater victory of sin in our lives and a greater love for one another. So Jesus begins here by telling us, whoever receives one such child in Christ's name receives Christ. Now, it's clear from verse 6, Jesus is not talking about all children in general, but receiving the one who believes in Jesus, the one who has humbled himself like a child to become a spiritual child of God. This is about receiving a fellow believer, a fellow Christian in Jesus' name. This involves welcoming, loving, accepting other believers because they are your spiritual brothers and sisters. They also have embraced Jesus Christ as the Lord. This will involve hospitality and great fellowship. I often find it amazing how, you know, I can meet a fellow believer, someone who I have no contact with, but can instantly have deep fellowship with because we have a common faith, because we have a common Lord, a common love for the word of the God and, and Christ. So you can really tell whether someone is a worldly Christian, a Sunday Christian, or whether someone really knows the Lord and has deep convictions within the very first few minutes of a conversation, within the first few minutes of hearing someone pray and the words that they use, you can know where somebody is at spiritually. I guess the challenge then is, you know, for, for me, it's the welcome to have fellowship, even with those who may be weaker in faith, those who may be different in faith and have different convictions, because that is what pleases the Lord here. So you think about it, it's easy to despise, it's easy to look down on those who are humble, you know, as losers. 
is those who will not advance very far in this kind of doggy dog world. The world says, if you want to get ahead, you must be aggressive. You must be assertive. But Jesus says, if you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, you must become humble like a child. Because really how we treat one another reflects how we treat Christ. And he gives us here in verse 6 a very strong warning. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be thrown into the bottom of the sea. See, if you receive a believer, that's the same thing as receiving Christ. Then if you reject a believer, you cause one to sin, that's the same thing as rejecting Christ. It is evil and wicked to sin. But far be it is even greater evil to cause and tempt and lead someone else into sin. Notice here, you know, tempting someone or causing someone to sin has this kind of picture of kind of laying traps to ensnare, you know, an animal, to lay traps to ensnare others into the sin and apostasy, into deserting the faith. And Jesus says here very strongly, if you cause another Christian to sin, one of my little ones, it would be better for you to have this giant millstone, this millstone that weighs hundreds of pounds, tied around your neck and for you to be thrown and drowned into the bottom of the sea. A very graphic, very terrifying way to die. An ugly death and painful death if you cause someone to sin. And you'd be wondering, you know, why, why, why the strong language? Why the graphic illustration? I mean, you can't possibly mean this, Jesus, right? But think about it kind of like this. Jesus is speaking of believers as tender little children. That's the imagery he is using. If you want to see me kind of filled with rage and anger, then do something to harm my young little boys. Push them, kick them when they're down, say mean things, hurl insults at them, discourage them, shame them, tempt them into sin. And you'll see how much righteous indignation a father would have for someone who tries to harm their little children. It's kind of that's the context of what Jesus is speaking from. It would be better for you to die an ugly death than to cause one of his little ones, one of his beloved ones, to sin. I think this is the same reason why the Bible is so forcefully speaking out against the false teachers. Because not only do they speak and do evil for themselves, but they teach and they lead and they lead other people into their sin, into their wicked beliefs, into their evil practices. So how can you cause a believer to sin? Well, there's many direct ways to tempt people to sin and dishonor God's word. The false teachers, like we've mentioned, do that all the time, cause believers to doubt God's word. Instead of following God's word, follow them into sin and disobedience. There are liberal teachers, there are liberal professors, liberal pastors who do this, who might ridicule anyone who would dare believe that the Bible is reliable and trustworthy, who would dare function as if the word of God is true. Well, they don't believe it's true. They believe the word of God needs to be updated and and it's out of date. You need to find truth from the culture and redefine what all these things mean. See, I know guys who were on fire for the Lord, loved Christ, loved the word of God, loved the doctrines of grace, and and not knowing better, they went to seminary. But I would say they went to the wrong seminary because the professors taught them to deconstruct their faith. You know, that they no longer believe in sound doctrine. They don't believe in the inerrancy and authority of the scriptures anymore. Instead, they believe in the wisdom of man. There are seminaries out there that do this to, to, you know, young and naive Students, you know, from time to time, I will also, you know, warn you with specific heretical doctrinal issues, even naming denominations from time to time and individuals as the texts come up because of the seriousness of what Jesus is saying here. And if you read through your Bible, you'll also know this, like almost every book of the Bible deals with false teachers and false teachings in some way, shape, or form because it is that dangerous to tempt someone into sin. You know, that may be doctrinal things, but there may be many other smaller sins we might think of. You know, a husband might ask his wife, hey, let's add this deduction to our tax return. After all, no one will ever know. No one will ever catch on. You know, that's leading someone to sin directly. There are many, many other examples of that. 
but there's also indirect ways to lead others to sin, things that we are not necessarily in, in, in tune to. I think of parents, you know, lead, you know, being over demanding of their children, being overly critical or overly protective on one side, or maybe another sin, overly permissive and, and neglectful, so that their children rise up one day and they rebel against us because of what we've done, and they rebel also against our God and our faith. On other hands, we can be too legalistic, focusing so much on the external behaviors with one another. On the other side, we could be simply, you know, failing to protect, failing to warn others when there is spiritual danger that we are aware of, we say and do nothing. We can also lead others to, to sin by failing to share the things we have learned, the lessons we have learned, the spiritual insights and the experiences that we have learned that would help them to grow. There's direct ways, there's indirect ways to lead people to sin. Another way is to tempt people by our bad example, by our attitudes, by our behaviors. You know, for me, I'm reminded all the time, I have three little pairs of eyes watching what I do all the time. Whether it's good or bad, they are learning and copying me in, in every way. If I get angry and yell at them when they mess up, guess what? I'm going to see them yelling at one another when they want, do things that hurt one another too. Monkey see, monkey do. They copy me, my bad example. Hopefully they learn many good things, but you know, they also pick up on all the bad things. And when, if you're around people who use a lot of profane language, eventually you're going to be start thinking and using that profane language as well because... You know, bad company corrupts good morals. You influence people by your example. And maybe a fourth way you tempt people to sin is the way you use your Christian liberties. Things that are not explicitly prohibited by Scripture. You know, there are those who may have a weaker conscience, a more sensitive conscience about things that are not explicitly sinful. But if you're not mindful about that and how you use your freedoms... You can tempt that weaker brother or sister to stumble into sin. I'm going to give you some examples. Whether it's like things like alcohol. You're free to drink alcohol, but if you get drunk, but what if you have someone who's a past alcoholic who you know, doesn't know their limits and stuff? You can cause that brother to sin. You can cause a brother to sin by the movies and the, the shows that you watch. Just talking about those things because you know, they might have a more sensitive conscience on where, what they, is appropriate for them to watch or not. There's a way to tempt uh, brothers to sin by the way we use our liberties. But Jesus here, he is confronting the disciples, saying, you guys don't have a right concern for each other. You're insisting upon being great, and that's causing everyone, all of the 12, to, to stumble into sinful anger, into jealousy, to wonder, why, why are they better? You know, I, I should be the greater. You know, if you ever tempted a Christian, you've ever mocked a Christian, you ever discouraged a Christian from serving the Lord, now listen to what Jesus is saying. These are harsh, strong statements. You know, if your Holy Spirit is convicting you that you don't have that right concern for others, but you say, no, I'm just going to keep on doing what I'm doing. I don't want to change. Jesus would say to you, no, are you even in the faith at all? If you don't have a love for your brother, your sister, my little children, do you really love me? Jesus is reminding us, you know, we and I, you and I, we have this responsibility to guard one another, to protect one another against sin. To have this selfless concern for one another's holiness. Not just to kind of let things go and be, but be active and encouraging and helping and guarding and safeguarding people from sin. We certainly don't want to tempt and, and, and mislead someone into sin. Because we know the world is all about doing that. The world entices us to sin all the time. And we should not be a free agent for the world. Now in verse 7 here, Jesus pronounces two woes, two divine curses. Woe to the world for a temptation to, to sin. For it's necessary for that temptation to come, but woe to the one by whom it temptations come. So what is a woe? A woe is a divine message of judgment. It's a curse. To say that God is bringing cursing upon your life. The first world woe here is to the world. It's cursed because the world does tempt us to sin. 
We know that this world, under the influence of Satan, the greatest tempter, the greatest deceiver is cursed because it leads us to disobey the Lord, leads us to sin. And there's no end to the temptations that come from the world, always trying to get us by the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. But we also know that God will come and judge the world in his return. The second temptation here, the second woe here is to the one who, by whom temptation comes. This is the tempter. If you, as a believer, tempt someone else to sin, just as Jesus told us, it'd be better for you to be drowned at the bottom of the sea with a millstone around your neck than to cause someone else to sin. So let us not be a stumbling block for others, because God will judge, he will punish. You know, at times, you know, we cannot help it if we're tempted or sinned against or offended in this world. But as believers, we always have that option to choose. I'm going to let go of anger. I'm going to let go of bitterness. I'm going to choose the path of forgiveness, even when it's hard. I'm going to entrust justice to God that he will punish, as he has said, the guilty. And I don't want to add any of my sinful anger. I don't want to add any of my offense or my vengeance upon that and cause other people to stumble. Because we know, you've experienced this too, you know, how much good work can be undone by just responding with words of anger or, or the wrong way. It's like, you know, think about it. You think about people, you, you know, what, what always pops out to you in your mind, the memories you remember are the ones where you, you've said something wrong or if they've said something wrong against you, they've responded in anger towards you. Even though that may have been a one-time thing, years of goodness, but that one spark, you always remember that. When someone has said something to you in harshness. And God promises he's going to judge the world. He's going to judge those who commit sin. So Jesus moves on here from dealing with the sins with others to now to deal with our own personal sins and temptations. Because we can also tempt others by our lack of self-control, our own laziness in pursuing spiritual holiness, personal holiness. And here Jesus says, you know, if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better for you to enter the life crippled or lame than to have two hands and feet and enter into the eternal flames. Now, throughout church history, some people have taken Jesus' commands here literally. They have mutilated themselves in attempting to stop sinning. But if they have found out the hard way, it does not work. A maimed person can still sin. A blind person can still commit lust. And as Jesus has been teaching us several times, sin and spiritual defilement is not a matter of what you eat or what you drink or what you do necessarily, but its root, it comes from the heart. It comes from your heart, which is expressed in the words that you speak and the actions that you do. It's a condition of the heart, and you must treat the heart first if you ever want to you know, purify the rest of your life. So it's clear here Jesus is speaking with what we call hyperbole. He's using exaggeration, overstating things for dramatic emphasis. And he's showing to us how rigorous we must be in our pursuit and our battle against sin and temptation. Remove, sever off that sin. Whatever causes you to sin before it leads to eternal judgment, the flames of hell. This shows us how serious, even violent we must be in our personal battle against sin, which is spiritual warfare. Now, I know for my own self, I often lose to sin and temptation because I'm just being lazy. I'm not really putting on the full armor of God. You know, I'm not standing and trusting in that victory that is mine in Christ. I don't treat sin like I'm fighting a war, that I'm in a war. I'm kind of on that peace and mentality, you know, that, that makes you spiritually lazy. I think we can all echo that, too. If we're in a war, some things just don't matter anymore. You're all about survival, right? We need to take Jesus' words to heart. I need to hear that. I need to get back into that wartime mindset that I need to be fighting sin in my own life or sin will be killing me. And for the disciples, they're sinning with self-centered pride and, and stirring up jealousy and anger that, and resentment that's built on to others. But here Jesus seems to be dealing with the issue of lust. How we must be radically committed to our own personal holiness. If you have certain habits, 
certain situations, certain circumstances, certain relationships that you know are prone to cause you to stumble into sin, Jesus is saying, you need to cut that off. You need to get rid of it before it destroys your whole soul forever. It's better to be crippled financially. It's better to be crippled socially, relationally, professionally, or in any other way. It's better to be crippled than be cast into the fires of hell. I think the obvious example that comes up is pornography. It's devastating to individuals. It's devastating to families and and to homes. If you were to take what Christ says here and apply it to this internet pornography of our day, Jesus would be telling us it'd be better to go through your entire life without internet access, without a computer, without a tablet, without a smartphone, than spend an eternity in hell. That's drastic. Get drastic in fighting sin. Get rid of spiritual poison. Protect your mind from defilement. And once you've been able to deal those wedding blows to your own sin, then you can be used by the Lord to help uh, safeguard and help others from sinning without that guilt-free conscience. Now, you can apply this to any other sin in your life as well. But what does Jesus here believe about hell? I think that's an important question to answer as well. What is hell according to Jesus? It's a place of eternal fire, verse 8. Eternal fire. Now, who's been burned before, right? It's like everybody, right? Whether it's, you know, you touched a hot stove or an oven, you put your hand in that hot water, or, you you know, you put your hand over the rice cooker when the steam's still coming up, you know, you get burnt, and instantly you know your body reacts to pain by just, you know, withdrawing your hand. Now imagine that same sensation, that pain of being burned, but not being able to withdraw your hand. Having an eternal body that can never die, never be reduced to charcoal and ashes. That's hell. Having this picture of being lit on fire and not being able to die. That's the pain Jesus is speaking of here, the eternal pain reserved for Satan, his demons, and all those who have not received Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. And although even though it's only unbelievers who ever see hell, understand by mentioning this, Jesus is telling us how serious we must be in fighting against sin and fighting against leading others into sin. Perhaps something we need to add here to fight against personal sin temptation is and what Jesus does tell us be radical in running away from sin running away from temptation but I think we also need to do more than just run away from it to prevent it we also on the other side the positive side must be cultivating our hearts and our minds to replace our love for sin and temptation with a greater love for something else or someone else for Christ you must replace one sinful habit with one good habit That's how you beat sin. Or maybe using the Apostle Paul's language, it's not enough just to put off sinful behaviors and practices and bad attitudes, but we also must be putting on what is holy and righteous and good. That's how you overcome sin and temptation. That's really what real repentance requires. It's not just saying, I'm sorry for messing up but I must also change my heart attitude towards it and change how my, my behavior towards this sin. I must replace my love and pursuit of this sin with my love for Christ and obedience to him and doing that with joy in your heart. So we must love Christ by seeking to protect one another from sin because our actions indirect or, or, or direct, our examples, the way we use our Christian behaviors can cause others to stumble into sin. And as we seek to protect one another, as because they're believers in Christ, we're demonstrating the proper love and humility and reverence that we must have for him. And unless we fall into hypocrisy as well, we can't just be you know, guarding others, we must also be fighting this sin in our own hearts, putting that to death daily, so we would pursue holiness and Christ's likeness for our own souls, for the sake of others we want to influence for God. And Jesus here, he gives us very strong warnings to fight sin, telling us to take radical action against sin in our life. 
So if the Lord has been convicting you hard about sin, whether it's your personal sin, whether it's, you know, I just have not loved one you, I have loved, not loved one another by warning and preventing and guarding one another against sin. You know, take that time, once we have time, and add, thinking about communion to confess that to the Lord. And the good news in the gospel is that, you know, if we confess our sins, our Lord is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. First John 1 John 1.9, memorize that verse. But also here's a good one from the Old Testament, Proverbs 28.13. Whoever conceals his transgression will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. If we repent of our sin and we make that commitment to change, we will find mercy in God through Christ. And for some of you here, you might not have that relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me encourage you, confess your sins, repent of them, forsake them, and turn to faith in Jesus, who died for your sins, so that you who put your trust in him will never face this eternal fire that has, he has mentioned, because Christ faced that for you. Instead, you'll find mercy and forgiveness and eternal life in him. This is our hope that we have all trusted in. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the strong sayings of Christ with which you warn us. And Lord, forgive us for just taking our own sin too lightly. Forgive us for taking how we interact with one another too lightly. Not safeguarding one another. Not be having a great enough interest in one another's personal holiness. Lord, help us to change. Help us to exercise real repentance real commitment and, and take practical steps to fight sin and kill sin in our lives and love one another and serve one another. We pray that you would do this in us and sanctify your church and your people. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.